my brave lad, he sleeps in his faded coat of blue. In a lonely grave alone lies the heart that beats so true. They will find him and know him amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue. No more the bugle the weary one. My name is Leon Meowser. Welcome to War of the Rebellion, Stories of the Civil War. We are continuing right where we left off after reading about Union mass readings in our reading of uh, Under the Maltese Cross, Antietam to Appomattox, The Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861 to 1865, Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment. In case you were wondering, yes, all of the titles are this long in all Civil War books. All right, let's get started. A Flag Incident The intense patriotism of the times manifested itself in the universal display of the flag, so that bunting soon became a scarce article. An incident happened at this period which showed the trend of the public mind. About the year 1798, the United States government erected a fort on a site fronting on the Allegheny River and bounded by Hand Street. Liberty Avenue, and Garrison Alley. In 1861, the storehouse and barracks of this fort at the corner of Penn Street and Garrison Alley was still standing, being in charge of Major Henry Talaferro, USA. The Major was a Virginian, a man at that date well over 70 years of age. He had served as an ensign in the War of 1812 and had been with Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. When, amid the extensive display of bunting throughout the city, this rendezvous and barracks was distinguished only by its absence, suspicion was excited. The old government buildings mentioned continuing to be flagless, a few ropes were strung by over-loyal people on nearby lampposts to intimidate all disloyal persons, and especially as a hint to Major Talaferro, in command of the rendezvous. An anonymous letter conveyed to the Major the purpose of these ropes, and demanded that he show his colors immediately by putting out the flag on the public buildings, under pain of being publicly denounced as a traitor. This epistle was secretly, at night, tacked upon the door of the barracks. The major, on discovering the insulting aspersion, vehemently denounced the anonymous author of the letter. He published a card in all the daily papers, announcing his sincere loyalty to the Union cause, and declaring that repeated requisitions for flags had been made, in answer to which the government had reported that it had run out of bunting, and that his requisitions had been delayed. This card satisfied the people of the venerable patriot's loyalty, and the incident was closed. A Central Military Rendezvous The rapid arrival and departure of large bodies of troops from points in western Pennsylvania, outside of Pittsburgh, and from Ohio and the west, most of whom, remaining over various periods of time, converted Pittsburgh in those days into a great military rendezvous. The Pennsylvania Volunteers, who were not accepted by the United States government under the first call of the president, did not disband, but continued their organizations. The wise provision of Governor Andrew G. Curtin in recruiting at this period of the Pennsylvania Reserve Corps for future emergencies resulted in the forming of two great camps, namely... Camp Wilkins on the old state fairgrounds at Penn and 29th Street, and Camp Wright at Holton Station. Camp Wilkins was established April 27, 1861, and had named in honor of the distinguished Honorable William Wilkins. Camp Wright was organized on May 28, 1861, by General George A. McCall of Philadelphia, an officer of the regular army detailed by Governor Curtin for that purpose. It was at first called Camp McCall. At one time, at a meeting in Wilkins Hall, Pittsburgh, 46 complete companies were reported as organized, representing over 4,000 men, ready for war. The local militia were also well-organized and splendidly equipped. Parades, reviews, drilling, flag presentations, and dress parades were everyday occurrences in Camp Wilkins and Camp Wright. 
The ladies of the city were usually the donors of flags, and were attendants as honor guests at the evening dress parades. At one o'clock in the morning of the 16th of May, 1861, Major Robert Anderson, the hero of Fort Sumter, passed through the city en route to Washington, and received an enthusiastic ovation despite the unusual hour. Western Pennsylvania sent from Pittsburgh to Wheeling and other points adjacent upwards of 400 recruits to be organized into companies for the loyal portion of Virginia. Pennsylvania's quota, under Mr. Lincoln's second call in 1861, was so promptly filled that recruits too late for enrollment under the state's quota were obliged to enlist in other states, whose quotas were unfilled. Western Pennsylvania thus furnished a large number of men, who subsequently rendered efficient service in the Mountain State. Being known as the Second Loyal Regiment of Virginia, among the prominent Pittsburghers thus enlisting in the Second Virginia in the service of the Union were Colonel John D. Owens, Captain Chatham T. Ewing, commanding a battery, Major A. J. Pentecost, quartermaster, H. Graham, Colonel David L. Smith, who was promoted to the position of Commissary of the 5th Corps, Army of the Potomac, James R. Hutchinson, Joseph Forsyth, John Siebert, Captain A.C. Hayes, Captain C. McClear Hayes, and Samuel Scott. Private William H. Graham, after three years' service, the term of his regiment in active service remained a year longer with the Army, and has distinction of being one of the survivors who witnessed the surrender of the Confederate Army at Appomattox serving with Sheridan's command on that occasion. For the same reason, the Friends Rifles, Captain Jacob Brunn, and the Pittsburgh Zouave Cadets, Captain John B. Glass, two companies recruited in Pittsburgh went to New York and were promptly accepted and mustered into the famous Excelsior Brigade, commanded by General Daniel E. Sickles, to serve for three years. Augustus H. Beckert, ex-commissioner of Allegheny County, lost a leg in battle while serving in the latter company. Other well-known citizens of Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, who after service in the Three Months Campaign re-enlisted at Pittsburgh in August 1861 in the 1st Maryland Cavalry, were Captains Robert H. Patterson, John H. Stewart, Leopold Sal Jr., killed in battle January 18, 1862, John Seaforth, and James M. Schoonmaker, Quartermaster Sergeant, later Colonel of the 14th Pennsylvania Cavalry, and late Private William Boston, 40 years tip staff in Allegheny County, Court Common Pleas Number 2, and Privates William Gashes and Edward William Zacharias. The full realization of the war and its horrors were first brought home to the people of Pittsburgh by the casualties befalling the Friend Rifles in the Pittsburgh Zouaves at the Battle of Williamsburg, May 5, 1862 where both those splendid Pittsburgh companies, then in New York regiments, in Sickles' Excelsior Brigade, and Hooker's Division, participated in that severe action, the brunt of which fell upon Hooker's Division. The brave Captain Jacob Brunn, commanding the Friend Rifles, was instantly killed in leading the attack, and his death was soon followed by that of the first lieutenant of his company, Martin V. Miller. Second Lieutenant Joseph F. Dennison was also seriously wounded, resulting in the loss of his leg. Thus, in a few moments, the company was wholly without officers. Captain John B. Glass's company, the Pittsburgh Zouaves, also suffered heavy losses in the same battle. The enemy outnumbered the Union forces and caused heavy losses in the rank and file. Fully a score of Captain Brun's company were taken prisoner and paroled within a few days of their capture. These prisoners returned to Pittsburgh in time to serve as pallbearers to their gallant captain. Captain Brunn was an accomplished linguist, and had been frequently called upon in earlier days by the courts of Allegheny County to act as an interpreter in the German, French, Italian, Spanish, Swiss, and other foreign languages, which he had acquired by his seven years' service in the Prussian army. The death and public burial of Captain Brunn being the first occurring to a Pittsburgh officer created profound sorrow. The funeral of Major John Poland of the 102nd Pennsylvania Volunteers, who was killed at the Battle of Fair Oaks, was the next to follow, that of the lamented Captain Brunn. 
the Scott Legion, survivors of the Mexican War in which Major Poland had served, attended the funeral service at St. Paul's Cathedral, where Bishop Dominic preached a patriotic funeral sermon. The Duquesne Greys acted as funeral escort to the remains of their late comrade to St. Mary's Cemetery. Organization, Pennsylvania Reserve Corps Pittsburgh was well represented in the Pennsylvania Reserve Corps, and the 8th Reserves were Company B, Captain Robert E. Johnston, Company C, Captain George S. Galoop, and Company E, Captain E.P. Schodenberger. Colonel George S. Hayes of Pittsburgh commanded this regiment. The 9th Pennsylvania Reserves were substantially a Pittsburgh regiment. Colonel Conrad Figure Jackson, the regiment's first colonel, and who had been promoted to brigadier general, was killed in battle at Fredericksburg, Virginia. He was succeeded in the colonelcy by Colonel Robert Anderson, a gallant and beloved officer, a former postmaster of Pittsburgh, and a veteran of the Mexican War. Eight companies were recruited in Pittsburgh for this regiment, one in Beaver County and one in Crawford County. The 116th Regiment, Pennsylvania Volunteers of Philadelphia, commanded by Colonel St. McClair Muholland, also had representation from Pittsburgh, and companies recruited by Major David McGraw of Allegheny City and by Captain Samuel Taggart, who was killed at Ream Station, Virginia, August 25, 1864. The news of Colonel Ellsworth's tragic death, May 21, 1861, was received in Pittsburgh with every manifestation of profound sorrow as the memory of his triumphal tour, his wonderful control of men, and the visit of the Chicago Zouaves to Pittsburgh were all still fresh in the mind of the public. His death added much to the prevailing excitement. Colonel Samuel W. Black Early in June 1861, Colonel Samuel W. Black, an eminent Democratic lawyer of Pittsburgh, returned from Nebraska, of which territory he was serving as governor, having resigned to recruit a regiment for the defense of the Union. He was a veteran of the Mexican War, in which he had acquired military experience as lieutenant colonel of the 1st Pennsylvania Regiment. Colonel Black promptly issued a call for volunteers and in a brief period recruited a regiment for the war, which later became famous as the 62nd Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry. The regiment was mustered into service at Pittsburgh July 4, 1861. The story of the organization of the gallant 62nd Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers at that period is interesting. Colonel Sam Black, on July 4, 1861, was serving as Chief of Staff to General William Wilkins, Commander-in-Chief of the 40 or 50 companies of Home Guard organizations which had sprung up in all parts of the city and county, and which rallied in the parks of Allegheny City for review and patriotic demonstration. General Wilkins' appearance on horseback with imposing chapeau of revolutionary style and immense epaulets and accompanied by a brilliant staff of young officers in full uniform, led by Colonel Black, presented an imposing spectacle of most impressive character, long to be remembered. On the return of the companies to the city from this great review, telegraph messenger handed to Colonel Black a dispatch from Secretary of War Cameron, authorizing him to recruit a regiment of volunteers in western Pennsylvania, on Penn Avenue, Colonel Black, on horseback, with this message in his pocket, overtook the 8th Ward Home Guards, commanded by Captain E.S. Wright. Out of respect to Colonel Black, the company halted and divided its ranks, so as to allow them to present arms as Colonel Black passed through on his way from the review. The colonel stopped to thank Captain Wright for the honor of the salute, and announced to him the contents of the dispatch just received from Secretary of War Cameron, stating that, although he was thus authorized, he had not, as yet, secured a single recruit for his regiment. He ended by inviting Captain Wright to have his company of home guards to be the first to volunteer for his new regiment. Captain Wright ordered his company to break ranks for a few minutes in order to act upon Colonel Black's message and invitation. At the end of five minutes, the question of volunteering had been submitted, and had been unanimously agreed that the company would volunteer to join Colonel Black's regiment, and that Captain Wright should be continued in the new company as captain. Also, that First Lieutenant William J. Patterson of the Home Guard Company should retain his office. Captain Wright's company of Home Guards became Company F of the new regiment, and he and Lieutenant Patterson served the full three years of the 62nd Regiment. Colonel John W. McLean reported at Camp Wilkins early in May 1861 with a magnificent regiment, 1,000 strong, recruited in Erie County for the three months' call. Its commander, Colonel John W. McLean, 
of Erie was made commandant of Camp Wilkins. The dress parades and the drilling of this fine regiment during the first three months of the war drew great crowds to the camp daily. This brave officer, like Black and Rippy, met a soldier's death at the hand of the 83rd Regiment in front of Richmond. Patriotism of German Americans No nationality responded to Mr. Lincoln's call for troops more promptly or loyally than did the American citizens of German birth residing in Allegheny County. The German organization of Turners were among the first to tender their services, almost in a body. On the expiration of the three months' campaign, the German companies immediately re-enlisted in regiments for three years' service. The 74th Pennsylvania Volunteers was organized in Pittsburgh by Colonel Alexander von Schimmingfig, a distinguished graduate of the German army. He earned promotion to a brigadier generalship for gallant and meritorious service with his regiment in the campaigns of the Army of the Potomac. Many companies, composed wholly of German citizens, were early recruited in Allegheny County by Captains Hatmeyer, F. Gerald, Gus Schleider, Louis Hager, and Bardell Galasaf, achieving fine military records. President Lincoln's Second Call for Troops In August 1862, President Lincoln's second call for 300,000 more soldiers was issued. Under this call... Many mere boys were accepted for military duty, some not being over 14 years of age. Fully one half of the 155th Regiment was recruited from boys between the ages of 14 and 18. The mortality tables show that these youths resisted disease and exposure better than did soldiers of maturer age. Pennsylvania's quota under the first call for troops was 12,500 men and 20,175 had been furnished. Under the second call, Pennsylvania's quota was 82,825 men for three years. For this call, 85,160 were actually recruited. The Pennsylvania Reserve Corps and other organizations in Camp Wilkins and Camp Wright, by this call, secured their long-desired chance to be mustered into the United States service for active duty. Recruiting received a great impetus and became an actual business. Pittsburgh officers also enlisted many recruits for the United States Navy, and especially large numbers for the gunboat, ram, and marine service on the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. General John C. Fremont passed through the city on July 26, 1861, and was accorded a public and enthusiastic welcome. The next day, Major General George B. McClellan, fresh from his victories over General Lee's Confederate Army in western Virginia, passed through the city, receiving a reception even more enthusiastic than that accorded General Fremont. General McClellan was at that time the hero of the hour on account of his great victory for the Union cause. As elsewhere in the north, the people of western Pennsylvania turned out on the occasion to make General McClellan's reception at the Union Station an ovation. On the 23rd of July, 1861, another great war meeting was held in City Hall, presided over by Sidney F. von Bonhorst, postmaster of Pittsburgh. Honorable Thomas M. Marshall delivered an impassioned patriotic opening address. Colonel Samuel W. Black followed as an orator of the evening. Colonel Black was in fine spirits to aid the objects of this great Union mass meeting when he delivered his address. He soon after marched with the famous 62nd Regiment to the front, and this proved to be his last public address. David Blythe, a painter of the humorous in Pittsburgh, who, by his war pictures attained national celebrity, immortalized on canvas the strenuous life and duties at commissary headquarters at York, Pennsylvania, of the famous old 13th Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers, in the three months' service, showing Captain J. Heron Foster, profiteer of the Pittsburgh Dispatch, serving with the regiment, Max K. Moorhead, quartermaster of the regiment, and Captain Leopold Saul, all prominent citizens and soldiers on duty in the camp. This rare painting of Blythe was loaned for copying in this work by the late Major William G. Moorhead. Return of the Three-Month Troops At this period, the three months' regiments commenced returning to the city from their bloodless campaigns in Maryland and in parts of Pennsylvania guarding railroads. 
Most of the returning volunteers felt disappointed in not having seen anything of actual war. They soon responded to Mr. Lincoln's second call, and now volunteered for three years or during the war. Immense crowds at railroad stations and in the streets enthusiastically welcomed these returning braves. Colonel Black had no difficulty in recruiting the 62nd Regiment. Colonel Oliver H. Rippey recruited ten companies. His regiment marched to the front and became famous as the 61st Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers. Colonel Alexander Hayes, a graduate of West Point and a veteran of the Mexican War, in a brief period recruited ten companies. He was commissioned colonel of the organization to become known as the 63rd Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers, which was destined to participate in every battle of the Army of the Potomac. General Hayes fell at the head of his division in the second day's battle of the wilderness, having attended the rank of Major General. General James S. Neagley, who was made a Brigadier General in the three-month service at the end of said term, soon recruited a brigade consisting of the 77th, 78th, and 79th Infantry Regiments from the counties of western Pennsylvania. Thomas E. Rose of Pittsburgh became Colonel of the 77th Regiment. He was captured by the Confederates later and escaped from Libby Prison by the celebrated tunnel. The departure of General Nigley's brigade from Pittsburgh for the seat of war in Kentucky aboard six large steamers from the Mongahela Wharf on October 18, 1861, formed a flotilla of beauty. The event attracted great attention along the Ohio River towns and landings until its destination was reached. Colonel Thomas A. Rowley, having returned from the old 13th Regiment from the three-month service, recruited a new regiment, which became the 102nd Regiment Pennsylvania Infantry. General Rowley became a major general by brevet. This regiment shared the glory of the old Sixth Corps in the campaigns of the Army of the Potomac. Its brave colonel, John W. Patterson of Pittsburgh, was killed in the wilderness. Colonel D.B. Morris, Lieutenant Colonel David M. Armour, and Captains James Chalfant and George W. Bowers recruited companies in the 101st Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers, which rendered valuable service to the Union cause. Colonel Theodore F. Lehman recruited a regiment which became the 103rd Pennsylvania, four companies of which, namely C, F, I, and K, were furnished by Allegheny County. Company G of the famous 11th Pennsylvania Infantry, which was recruited by Colonel Richard Coulter of Greensburg, was furnished by Allegheny County. This regiment earned great distinction in its campaigns, being noted in Fox's Book of Regimental Losses for its high percentage of casualties. Cavalry Recruits The 1st Cavalry Company was recruited in the southern part of the county and in the adjacent townships of Washington County. The organization became Company K of the 1st Pennsylvania Cavalry. Company G of the same regiment was recruited by Captain O. H. Robinson and Colonel David Campbell of the Old 12th Infantry. The Allegheny County Companies B, E, and G and the 4th Pennsylvania Cavalry were commanded by Captain Samuel B. M. Young, James A. Heron, and Benjamin F. Blood. Lieutenant Colonel James H. Childs was promoted to colonel of this regiment in March 1862 and was killed in the Battle of Antietam. Captain Samuel B. M. Young, at the close of the war, had attained the rank of colonel of this regiment. Dr. C. P. Seip, the well-known Pittsburgh physician, served as the bugler of this regiment throughout the war. Many officers and men of the Anderson Troop, first known as Buell's Bodyguard, also enlisted in Pittsburgh. This troop later became the 15th Regiment Pennsylvania Cavalry. Serving in this regiment, the gallant Major Frank B. Ward of Pittsburgh lost his life in battle at Stone River. Judge James W. Over, Associate Law Judge of the Orphans Court of Allegheny County, served throughout the war in this regiment, earning a most enviable record as a faithful trooper. Colonel James M. Schoonmaker recruited the 14th Pennsylvania Cavalry. He was awarded a Medal of Honor by the Congress of the United States for gallant and meritorious services in the field. The late Colonel William Blakely became lieutenant colonel of this regiment. Among the early cavalry enlistments from Pittsburgh was that of heroic Captain Patrick Kane, who fell commanding his company under General Sheridan in the action at Hawes Shop 
May 28, 1864. His company of the 13th Pennsylvania Cavalry was recruited from the Shields Guards, a volunteer company which under Captain Kane was the pride of Pittsburgh's Irish population for some years preceding the Civil War. Organization of Batteries The artillery service was an early and attractive one to youths seeking to enlist. Captain James Thompson, an esteemed Irishman, a veteran of the Crimean War, was commissioned captain by Governor Curtin to rank from September 24th, 1861. His battery was officially designated Independent Battery C, Pennsylvania Artillery. Captain Joseph M. Knapp, organizer of Knapp's famous Cannon Foundry of Pittsburgh, was next in line with the commission dated October 5th, 1861. He was followed by Captain Robert B. Hampton, commissioned October 17th, 1861. These artillery companies were all mustered in the fall of 1861 and were best known locally and also in the service by the names of their first captains. They won great distinction as Thompson's, Knapp's, and Hampton's batteries. Their itinerary records include the history of the Army of the Potomac, also of Sherman's campaigns and March to the Sea. Captain Thompson served throughout the war and survived after its close to the ripe age of 89 years. Captain Knapp, after honorable service, resigned in 1863. Captain Hampton met a soldier's death on the bloody field of Chancellorsville. A fine monument in the public parks in the city commemorates his memory. Companies C and E of the 57th Regiment Pennsylvania Infantry were recruited in Pittsburgh in the fall of 1861 by Captains William B. Nieper and James B. Moore, two active members of the Duke Kane Greys, who won honors and promotions in the field. Captain Nieper became lieutenant colonel of the regiment, especially distinguishing himself at Chancellorsville and in a number of other battles in which his regiment suffered most severely. All right, we're going to go ahead and call it there for today. I know, man, I wanted to cover a couple of things for... I jump into the show notes to talk about some stuff. First off is going to be reorganizing how the show works. There's not going to be a, a Patreon. I just kind of want to focus on doing the work that I'm currently engaged in. And then I'll worry about that later. But um, I think I'm going to be releasing episodes weekly, but they're going to be on Sunday nights. So Monday morning when you wake up, there should be a new episode waiting for you for your ride to work. Let's take a look at some of these end of show notes that I had. All right. So one of the things that I wanted, I made a mental note of is when they were talking about Captain Brunn, who could speak a bunch of different languages and you're hearing about him and you're like, wow, this guy's a perfect soldier. Well, yeah. And entire regiments of perfect soldiers get chewed up in this conflict. And it is one of the most frustrating things when you get to learn about all of these individuals and then just how much they just get destroyed as this conflict goes on. All right. Uh, the other mental note, mental note, the actual note that I made was for Colonel Black offering the eight home guards, the ability to join his uh, newly made regiment that he got from the uh, War Department, that's nuts. That does not happen very often. So not like that. So that must have been pretty crazy for those guys. But voting itself is super common at this point in time um, among the Army. Whether it was voting at home or voting in elections or voting as a group, it's super common for guys to vote about all sorts of stuff. In fact, at this time period, you see a lot of officers who are voted in by their men, at least in the in the beginning of the war. And as new regiments are formed, there's a lot of voting going on. Oh, and also, so I've met men like Colonel Black uh, while I was serving in the, in the Marine Corps. So it ended up like they hold a different vibe and presence from normal men. It's we're all mortal, but sometimes you just meet specific people 
where you're like, wow, that person's history, though. Like, I'm mortal. That person is crazy. That's probably <laughs> what it really is. Uh, we also have the introduction to immigrants. As we move forward and we're reading all these books and we get into more books, a lot of them are going to be me mispronouncing names like crazy because there's a lot of immigrants at this point in time coming over and forming entire regiments and divisions. So, and we have some really cool, like there's a couple of books that I want to cover that mention like dealing with artillery batteries that are entirely German. So they would like run up to be like, Hey, and everyone there only spoke German. So very entertaining. Okay. So Colonel Thomas Rose, they basically mentioned breaking out of, that celebrated tunnel, right? Well, it's the Libby prison tunnel. It's a big deal in the Civil War. They give it one line of mention here, but essentially there's a huge warehouse that's being used by the Confederates to hold officers. And it's called Libby prison. And there's a single room in an abandoned kitchen. It's completely overrun with rats. And they built a tunnel inside the building that led to there. And so what they could do was, sneak in there and build their tunnel to try and escape and then uh, go back into the rooms when they were done. But they would always keep like one man down, like covered in straw so they could watch the tunnel. And they're just having rats crawl all over them. Oh, uh, I have a quote from Union Major A.G. Hamilton, and he described it as, the only difficulties experienced were the lack of proper tools and the unpleasant feature of having to hear hundreds of rats squeal all the time while they ran over the diggers almost without a sign of fear. Libby Prison is an incredible story of American history. I highly recommend it. Maybe it's, at some point we'll cover it as well. There's a lot of people wrote books who were in prison there. Um, in case you were confused about the three-month service that was talked about quite a bit in this last section, Abraham Lincoln initially called for 75,000 men for three months to put down the rebellion. It quickly became apparent that that was not going to do it. So then it became three years or to the end of the war. That's where a lot of those regiments that they're talking about are. They came back like that. Those German regiments came back from doing their three month service and immediately re signed back up. Colonel Schoonmaker, who won a medal of honor. I went ahead and looked him up because if he's got a medal of honor, then you can read his citation. And I thought I would do that. James Martinus Schoonmaker. Date of issue, May 19th, 1899. The President of the United States of America, in the name of Congress, takes pleasure in presenting the Medal of Honor to Colonel James Martinus Schoonmaker, United States Army, for extraordinary heroism on the 19th of September, 1864. While serving with the 14th Pennsylvania Cavalry in action at Winchester, Virginia, at a critical period, Colonel Schoonmaker gallantly led a cavalry charge against the left of the enemy's line of battle, drove the enemy out of his works, and captured many prisoners. So, all right, those are just some of the mental notes that I had that I wanted to share with you guys about some of the more interesting facts. And as we read more and we get into other parts of the war, there's going to be a lot more to talk about, and so this line will probably get longer and longer and longer, so... I think right now I'm approaching like 10 recorded minutes with editing. It's probably going to be about seven. So if it does keep getting longer, oh, well, and we're going to go ahead and call it a day here. And we'll see you next week on War of the Rebellion, stories of the Civil War. Have a great week. In a lonely grave alone lies the heart that beats so they will find him and know him amongst the good and true when a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue no more the bugle calls the weary one rest noble spirit in thy grave alone they will find you and know the good and true when a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue 
He cried, give me water and just one little crumb, and my mother, she will bless you through all the years to come. Go tell my sweet sister, so gentle, good, and true, that I'll meet her up in heaven or in my faded coat of blue. No more the bugle calls the weary one. Rest, noble spirit, in thy grave alone. They will find you and know you amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded gold of blue.